Hello, everyone, and welcome to Think Yourself Healthy podcast. I'm your host, Heather Duranja. Let's dive into today's episode. Hello, everybody. On today's episode of Think Yourself Healthy, I have special guest. We have Brendan Vermeyer. Brendan is a functional medicine consultant, mental and metabolic health researcher, educator, writer, and speaker. He began his career as a personal trainer and nutrition coach at the age of 19 after disappointingly being medically discharged from the United States Navy SEAL training pipeline due to an injury. After being exposed to the power of functional lab testing in the start of his career, he began intensely pursuing that as a career path, which led him to be widely regarded as one of the top leading experts in metabolic health and functional education. Brendan, thank you so much for being with us today. What an exciting um, bio. You know, I myself absolutely am obsessed with lab testing, functional lab testing specifically. As we discussed prior to us officially starting this interview, our training and background um, started in the same, the same, uh, basically the same um, setting really in the gym environment, working with a very well-renowned company who specializes in cutting edge research and really making lab testing um, a vital component of overall health. So thank you for being with us, Brendan. I appreciate it. Absolutely, Heather. I'm, I'm excited to chat today. I mean, as we were just saying, yeah, basically identical uh, kind of roots of, of our career. And, um, you know, that corporation is doing some really great things. Like you literally had the position that I wanted to achieve with that corporation. But um, as you're well aware, they, they require you to be a registered dietitian in order to um, really analyze labs, which from like a legal perspective, I get it makes sense. But uh, the reality is like lab analysis is a skill that's not taught anywhere in academia. Uh, so it, it just, I, I had to break away. I actually went back to school while I was working full time for that corporation. And, you know, I was kind of pursuing like, did I want to do dietetics so I could, you know, get that position like you held or, I considered naturopathic medicine. I kind of considered conventional medicine, but that never really resonated so much. But it's really interesting where I know that you and I can relate on this. There's a huge difference between looking at, you know, biomarkers and lab testing from a, how do we optimize of your metabolic health and physiological well-being and using that objective data from more of a uh, health and performance perspective rather than more of a allopathic disease management using pharmaceuticals type of thing. And, you know, I think you and I, just from the sound of it and based on the timeline, I think we were kind of in that early wave where like this industry just wasn't quite there yet. And the idea of kind of going outside of the model and um, being a little bit more innovative with how you use kind of old school lab testing and biomarkers. So it's just now that this whole like functional lab testing and functional lab analysis movement is really exploding. And, you know, I'm, I'm proud of people like us for kind of breaking away from that, like, um, I don't know, rigid yeah. model of like, there's so much more that can be done here. So it's, it's cool to see us spread our wings and fly a little bit. Absolutely. I know for myself as a registered dietitian, we aren't taught, you know, we're taught basics when it comes to lab analysis. However, um, they're using conventional markers and, and basically can this person be diagnosed and treated with some sort of pharma, you know, pharmacological agent or some form of surgical method in order to treat the symptoms that they're experiencing. And for me, one of my most prized um, takeaways from that whole career experience was I got to go and train personally with Dr. Brian Walsh. And when I had the opportunity to train with him in 2014, that was such an incredible experience. I learned so much from all of his expertise and from the plethora of experts that, you know, we had access to. So I truly believe in, um, 
and the efforts there and the science behind that. And I pride myself as a registered dietitian. I'm not like a lot of the registered dietitians out there. I'm what I would consider more of a functional registered nutrition, you know, dietitian nutritionist. And because of that, it really has allowed me to help serve my clients to the best ability in terms of optimizing their health and wellness and not just treating symptoms. Absolutely. So, yeah. I, I was going to mention Brian Walsh. I, I had a feeling that there was probably a, a common lineage there. And uh, Brian was one of my previous mentors. And um, I've only had uh, really a few kind of mentor figures throughout my career. Um, and he's one of my favorites where uh, I, I always like to think about, you know, the best teachers, they don't tell you what to see, but they show you where to look sort of thing. And that's kind of how it was studying with Brian Walsh is he opened my eyes to um, honestly, just like a different way of thinking, a different way of looking at lab testing and biomarkers and, and just physiology in general. I mean, when it comes to um, functional medicine, I, I think there's a lot of room for improvement with the functional medicine space, shall we say. And, uh, you know, Brian's really kind of second to none with knowing the cellular physiology behind every single biomarker. So you can really think critically through like what's physiologically, metabolically, biochemically going on here. And then it's just a matter of like, what's the intervention that you want to use, whether that's an exercise regimen or nutrition coaching or some supplementation or, you know, pharmaceuticals, if you're a licensed provider, right. But at least it, it opens up a more, uh, uh, comprehensive analysis of, you know, this bio individualized approach to optimizing wellness, right? Yeah. How exciting. I feel like, I feel like you and I have definitely been on similar career paths and journeys. So I'm curious to know for you, how with the journey you've been, been on professionally and personally, how did this convert into the mental health space? Yeah, that's a big question. So, you know, as, as we uh, have kind of mapped out, we started our careers very similarly. And, you know, I, uh, when I started with that company, I, I was really quickly falling in love with just the science of human health and performance, really just good old metabolic science, which uh, especially now that I'm pretty well established in the functional medicine space, when I was kind of coming up in the industry, like a little weed, you know, I just sprouted really quick and kind of put everybody on watch. And at first I was a little bit worried that maybe since I don't have a medical license, I don't have the RD, ND, MD behind my name, you know, would I be respected or, or whatever? But I really come to find like really knowing your stuff is not reflective of letters. And there's a big difference between more that allopathic disease management uh, versus more just metabolic, like that word metabolic to me, you know, it's ingrained in, in everything ab about me. It took me a while to realize a lot of doctors don't have a very good understanding of metabolic. You look at the fact that 88% of Americans are now considered metabolically ill based on that study in 2020, which is based on very archaic you know, measures of health, you know, waist circumference and dyslipidemia and blood pressure and so on and so forth, like very crude, you know, like reliable, but crude measures of deep health, right? Um, and so I think that's the huge missing gap. And this is why I think there's this new generation of, you know, trainers, nutritionists, health coaches, biohackers, I think they're just as valuable, if not more valuable than medical professionals these days, because we don't need more disease management. We actually have to teach the general population how to achieve true metabolic health. And if there's one thing that, you know, the past couple of years and everything going on uh, with the pandemic, if there's one thing that's been made very clear, it's the American population does not know what it is to be metabolically healthy or how to achieve uh, metabolic health. And of course that word metabolic trips people up, but we could just scratch that and say health, right? And so for me with mental health, 
when I became a trainer and nutritionist and I'm, you know, getting into some of those um, kind of fundamental things like macros and VO2 testing and using the lab work and having the fancy body fat scanner, I actually became much more neurotic and kind of orthorexic with my behavior because you you kind of get this false sense of control. Like if you just count all of your macros and you weigh your food and you do the heart rate zones at the right time, you know, you follow all the rules that are kind of based on rough science, you have that control and you can sculpt your health and your body, however you see fit. And it's quite a bit more than that. And I, I think I, and there's so much to unpack there, but ultimately my mental health hit an all time low, like early in my personal training and nutrition coaching career. Uh, and there were a lot of reasons that's, you know, that's hours and hours of telling, but ultimately uh, when I was 21, I was diagnosed with two mental health disorders, ADHD and, and major depressive disorder. Uh, and through my evaluation, when I was 17, that was the first time I was put on a psychiatric drug and no evaluation was done. That was my primary care physician. I was just doing a physical for high school sports. And I mentioned some you know, feelings of depression and seasonal affective disorder. So without any blood work, without any evaluation, without even being referred to a mental health professional, like a psychiatrist or clinical psychologist, like, hey, kid, you know, here's uh, Zoloft, right? Which we now know is associated with potentially an increased risk of suicidal ideation and sexual dysfunction and all sorts of other issues. So that was when I was 17 and it wasn't until four years later then he threw a different psychiatric drug at me, which was a dopamine drug, Wilbutrin, and then referred me to a clinical psychology clinic where I underwent, you know, subjective questionnaires and assessments. So again, I'm really distinguishing between objective biomarker data versus subjective, you know, um, kind of clinical presentation and some questionnaires. So then I was officially diagnosed ADHD, major depressive disorder, and then put on two more drugs on top of the Wellbutrin of Vyvanse and Adderall. And it was literally two weeks later that I woke up in the intensive care unit breathing out of the tube because I intentionally overdosed and swallowed my entire bottle of Wellbutrin. Um, and so I literally went through, I mean, once I, I, I was in a medically induced coma, for like 56 hours. I almost died is what I was told. And they thought they were going to lose me. Um, I spent like another four nights in the ICU, having my whole body just flushed and trying to get my liver enzymes out of thousands. It wasn't until I was in the ICU that anybody ever did any blood work, right? Because according to the conventional and psychiatric conventional system, like there are no biomarkers of mental health, which is, you know, just to be candid, because I get lit up about this stuff that's just stupid. It doesn't align with the scientific literature at all. It's, it's a business model narrative that fits a big pharma dispensary business model. It has nothing to do with valid science of physiological origins that manifest as you know, mental illness, right? So after that, I actually was in a psychiatric ward uh, for like five days, literally locked up, like couldn't step outside to see the sun or get fresh air, no That's options. Good. Yeah, it, yeah, it was, it was a straight up psychiatric ward. And, and so, you know, I could go on and on and on, but like I literally went through the psychiatric it's model. Um, I went through it. I experienced firsthand just how broken archaic, dysfunctional, it really is. I've dealt with a lot of psychiatrists and they just treat you like a, a child that doesn't know how to take care of themselves. Like you're a broken thing that can only be mended by pills. And they have zero understanding of metabolic health or physiological well-being. So I think we as a nation or collective or even global with mental health, I mean, you look at the epidemiological statistics where, you know, suicide is the 10th leading cause of death for Americans, uh, neurodegenerative disease, Alzheimer's is six. Um, you know, it's it, suicide's the second leading cause of death for ages 10 to 34. And this is despite the fact that we consume more psychiatric drugs than any other population on the planet. So you just look at that and it's like, we are clearly doing something very, very wrong when it comes to mental health in this country. Absolutely. So I myself have taken my business model and converted it into the mental health and substance abuse demographic. This is, this is my 
my people. These are the people that I want to help serve. And um, because I myself have lived it firsthand, I had my first experience with getting um, treated for anxiety and depression at 11 years old. I can remember being a little girl sitting down to, you know, eat meals and my stomach would always hurt me. I'd always have tummy aches. I had no appetite. And I would complain to my parents. They'd take me to the doctors. The doctors would say, we can't find anything. It's all in her head, you know? Mm -hmm. So my reality started to get gaslit. Um, I couldn't trust authority figures. I couldn't trust myself. This created a lot of confusion, which then led into me starting to self-harm. And at the age of 15, I had my first in-hospitalization psychiatric type care setting. And it was probably one of the most traumatic experiences. Um, anyone who has ever been institutionalized like that knows exactly what we're talking about. It is, uh, it, I, in my opinion, I think that it does more harm than it does good. Um, and unfortunately, one of the questions that was never asked was, does Heather have any deficiencies? You know, what's going on nutrient wise to, the fact that Heather is not, you know, this thriving being. And um, the reality is I grew up as a child addicted to sugar. I ate mm -hmm. junk, literally mm -hmm. junk. And um, about 90% of mental health diagnoses have an underlying nutritional deficiency that has not been addressed. And unfortunately, when you go to the doctor and you start saying, hey, I've lost my motivation. I have no desire to have sex anymore. They say, wow, you sound depressed. Here's a pill. Take this. You should start feeling better. And I suggest you go and see a therapist. So we do the talk therapy. We take the medication. Six months, a year later, we're still not feeling any better. And we interpret that information as if we are fundamentally flawed and we find ourselves staying stuck in that negative healing loop of self-sabotage. And it just contributes to the problem. And it's very, very frustrating. As a as a you know practitioner uh, specializing in this field, I see it every day when mm -hmm. I get my hands on these individuals and I'm like, where's the lab work? I want to see your vitamin D levels. I want to know where fatty acids, omega sixes, omega threes are. I want to know what B12 is doing, what folate is doing, where is magnesium? All of these, all of these factors play such a vital component with our mental health. In 2018, I um, started having massive suicidal ideation, like massive suicidal ideation. I had my nutrition down. I had my exercise. I had all of the things, right? I can't understand why is this happening to me? Well, I went to the doctor to try and get some lab work done and I wanted a vitamin D specifically. They wouldn't do it because I was under the age of 45. They said women under the age of 45, it's no longer standard routine to draw vitamin D labs. I was infuriated. So I went to Quest, paid out of pocket. My vitamin D came back as a six. I was in a critically low area that was contributing to why I was having these suicidal ideations. Now, unfortunately, I have a chronic kidney disease and my body does not synthesize vitamin D efficiently due to the IgA nephropathy. And so for me specifically, I have to be on very, very large doses of vitamin D in order to maintain the stability with mental health. And I just recently had an incident where I got my vitamin D up to an 85. And then my doctor took me off of my supplementation against my will. I argued with them explaining that this is going to have negative, negative consequences. So within two months of me not having the oral 150,000 IU a week supplement on top of the 10,000 IUs I take daily, getting adequate sun exposure and making sure I make an effort at getting plenty of vitamin D through my diet, my vitamin D in the eight weeks that I didn't have that supplementation dropped down to a 22. And I felt the impact of that on my mental health. Uh, the depression started to creep in and it just goes to show you know, um, how beneficial lab testing can be at helping us to understand what is, what is our, where is that comfort range for me personally, right?
Where yeah. am I going to be in an optimal state in order to maintain my, my mental health, despite all of the other efforts I'm making for me specifically supplementation is, is necessary. It's something that I will have to continue to do for the rest of my life in order to maintain optimal mental and physical health. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks for sharing that. It's amazing how much we have in common and I'm sure we could, uh, you know, kind of nerd out all day on all the cool, because that's, you know, that's what I've dedicated my career to is really just mapping out the the root causes of, of mental health dysfunction, which, you know, um, like I, I just recently developed my own lab test specifically for mental health, and that's kind of taken over my career. What? So, Tell me more. <laughs> well, so I, you know, with, with all of this, I used to... Um, for years now, I've always created, you know, custom panels for each individual, right? And I'm sure you do the same where it's like, because like, you know, we talked a lot about vitamin D just now. And of course, like that's one out of how many potentially relevant markers. And so this is where that's kind of part of why the conventional system has the narrative and stance they do is there kind of are no biomarkers of mental health because it's not like it's just one thing, right? It's not like there's like, if there was a single biomarker of mental health, I think it would be serum BDNF, but that's not currently available and I'm trying to get my hands on it. But um, there's so many, right? And, and it's not like there's, you know, one root cause. It's not like it's one thing. It actually, you know, it's like an auto mechanic. You know, if your car is making weird sounds, like you have to lift, lift up the hood, you got to dig around. Is it the belt? Is it the radiator? Is it, you know, I don't know anything about cars, but I know a lot about human physiology, right? right. So you do actually have to look at the functionality of these core physiological systems to figure out, you know, what systems are dysfunctional and how could that be contributing? And we talk all about in, in our industry, these different axes, right? The HPA axis or the gut brain axis or the liver brain axis or whatever. Um, but there's just so many different pathways through which if any of them are dysfunctional, whether it's vitamin D or magnesium or, you know, microbiome thing or vagus nerve thing or a liver thing, um, it can all be ultimately contributing to this neuroinflammatory cascade in the brain. So I developed a panel where, the the core focus of the panel it's called the microglial activation profile or we call it the mental map is like consumer friendly you know name for it because that's way catchier um but essentially it was that it, it was the idea of being designing a, a comprehensive panel that's looking at some of those core markers that are related to this oxidative and neuroinflammatory cascade because then you can kind of reverse engineer that a little bit for one thing you have reliable biomarkers that you know, whatever you're trying to do to improve your health, whether it's pharmaceuticals or supplements or health and wellness building routines or whatever it is, you have objective data to show like, am I moving in the right direction or are things getting worse? But it also kind of shows you which systems of the body are a little bit more dysfunctional. Do we need to give the liver a little bit more love? Do we need to give the gut a little bit more love? Is it more of a hormonal thing? But that's where like when you start mapping out, you know, all, all these different root causes and there's so many, right? Right. But you just kind of look at like, I think sometimes uh, consumers, clients, patients, they kind of get sucked down these rabbit holes and that's not really helpful, right? Like, well, I think it's an MTHFR and a methylation thing and they kind of right. lose themselves down that rabbit hole or, well, I think, you know, this one doctor said it might be parasites and they go down that rabbit hole or mold or whatever. And that's not helpful, right? Because you get stuck down these rabbit holes and you're focusing well, on one thing that might not even be there. Well, right? and yeah. And so what I'm hearing is, is that uh, more often than less as consumers, we've been taught to be victims. So we mm -hmm. tend to seek a diagnosis, attach ourselves to that diagnosis as a way of justification. And then because we are an instant gratification society, we want this quick fix, this, you know, band-aid to put over the problem. We seek the easiest alternative in order to mask our symptoms, which tends to be pharmacological um, modes for the most part, you know, that we tend to embrace as being the solution instead of truly having the ability to get to that root cause. Right, right. I think the root cause paradigm, it's great for marketing, but I don't think it is that great from more of like a clinical, you know, perspective in the sense that like, 
you you want like a tangible explanation of like well it's not it's not my fault like i'm a victim it's because i have this thing this root cause you know that's mercury or mold or microbiome or whatever and you kind of attach your sense of identity to that like i'm a victim it's not my fault i just need that silver bullet protocol you know whether whether it's or or that fancy supplement protocol from some self-proclaimed functional medicine doctor that, you know, there's no such thing as a doctor of functional medicine, right? So people get lost in that. And, you know, what we have to really look at is the fact that you look at the standard American lifestyle that creates what I call the standard American metabolism. And it's like virtually everything about it, you know, is pro-inflammatory, pro-oxidative, just destructive to your overall metabolic health. And you wonder why, like, you don't feel too great, right? And you mentioned it a second ago or earlier, you know, I think like cognitive symptoms and dysfunction and and libido, Mm -hmm. I think those are like the two most sensitive indicators of metabolic health. Like as soon as things are getting a little bit dysfunctional under the surface, like your libido goes and your cognition goes. It's so, and and energy, which kind of fits into that, right? Um, In a lot of ways, those are very similar things, cognitive energy, sexual energy, or just energy in general. Uh, And that, that tells us like, so I think people need to kind of check the basic boxes of the fundamentals of how to live a healthy lifestyle before getting caught up on chasing these kind of fallacious root causes, right? Right. Absolutely. Well, and I think that unfortunately with our conventional medicine, you know, we compartmentalize the physical body. We see a cardiologist, we see a neurologist, we see a gastroenterologist, we see all of these different practitioners. And unfortunately there is no cross communication There is no, you know, checking of protocols across the board. And so it gets very confusing as a consumer because we might go see one individual who puts us on a specific protocol that completely contradicts the protocol that we've received from the other doctor. I just had a client send me a protocol that their gastroenterologist put them on for a SIBO diet and it was high fiber. And I was just like, say what? (laughs) Like I'm reading through this protocol, looking at what the doctor's recommendations were going, oh my God, I cannot believe that this is what this doctor is actually prescribing to his clients. And this is only contributing to the problem and why they're not getting better. So it gets really defeating as a consumer because there's just so much misinformation. There's so many different protocols. There's so many potential root causes, right? Right. Right. And I'm a firm believer of really looking at the individual's lifestyle. Let's take a look at snapshot of this lifestyle. Let's identify where the biggest barrier is right now that's working against you. And let's try to incorporate some realistic strategies to get the ball moving in the right direction. I want to point out, and I have a feeling the situation was probably the same for you. When I worked at this particular company, which is regarded as the number one health and wellness company that any health and wellness professional can be a part of. I was at my sickest. Mm -hmm. I was working 16 hour days, six days a week, running myself into the ground. Now, a lot of it was excitement. A lot of it was, I want to know more. I want to have exposure. So a lot of it was self-driven. But the point is, is that here I am, I'm in a setting where I have resources and I'm being promoted to live this healthy lifestyle, yet I was truly my sickest. I was getting the least amount of sleep. I was overly stressed, especially trying to meet, to meet um, goals, <laughs> certain <Hold on>. goals <laughs> that had to be met, you know, especially yeah. being the regional. It was really challenging um, because I had a lot of pressure, a lot of stress. And ultimately it destroyed my gut health. My gut suffered, which then, you know, had an impact on my immune system and allowed for um, HPV to go into cervical cancer. So it was really, you know, that was a real lesson for me in understanding 
Well, I think it's pretty safe to say that the original root cause of almost all disease is deeply embedded in stress management. It all starts with stress management. It all starts with nervous system regulation. And most of us really um, are unaware of where the root wiring of our nervous system actually took place and how we are truly addicted. When you're talking about the orthoanorexia, you know, this is a a coping mechanism that you adopted in order to keep your nervous system in that baseline state of survival, which was being highly micromanaged, right? The, the stress of needing to micromanage every single little component. It's oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're speaking my language and I, I too, my health was at the lowest when I was working for that corporation. And um, you know, it's not a knock against the business, the, the company necessarily, but, uh, the, the corporate ladder, the corporate box of like, we're going to put you in a box and, you know, you, you, you have to fit that mold. And it's, it's a very, um, constricting way to live. And, uh, I'm a very expansive kind of dude and I just couldn't. So I, I found way more health and happiness and success, not, you know, allowing myself to be constrained in a box and, and all of that. Um, but, you know, it was a beautiful start to the career because it, it gave me exposure to, to your point, to all these, all these great resources. And that's where like, uh, on my, on my Instagram, my little template, I have this little brain yin yang and, and what that symbolizes is I, I do like to distinguish wh why I think mental health is so much more kind of mysterious and ambiguous than, you know, just simply like gut health or, you know, whatever it is, because with mental health there, there's the two major sides of it. There's the psychological, psychoemotional, but then the physiological and, I think it's important to kind of differentiate between those where like with individual clients, you almost have to map out what are our more like psychoemotional kind of outlook perspective healing opportunities versus the more physiological. Um, I think the physiological is easy if you're a really good practitioner, right? Like you can, oh, great. Like, uh, you know, you're insulin resistant, fatty liver, dysbiotic, leaky gut, brain, mitochondria, whatever, right? Like that's kind of easy from a specific supplementation or specific dietary, you know, kind of prescriptions or whatever, but the psychoemotional that's, that's hard, right? Like really, uh, doing that inner work and, you know, for lack of a better way to put it, like owning your shit. Right. And yeah. I, I think you're on the same page with me of a lot of these people that are, you know, obsessively and neurotically chasing root causes and, you know, burning through practitioner after practitioner, like revolving door, uh, what I think a lot of these people are doing and they don't realize it is they're kind of subconsciously spiritually bypassing the stuff that they know they need to work on. They know that they need to face it and own it and tackle it head on. And that's the hardest part. Right. Um, and unfortunately I think practitioners accidentally enable some of that behavior because they're so eager to get a new client or patient, sell that lab test, sell some supplements, get them on a protocol. That's just like, sure, I'll be able to find your root cause better than the last person. But all we're doing is enabling them bypassing the stuff that they know they need to do. Like you're not, you're not exercising and you wonder why you're not mentally healthy. Like you're not eating whole foods. You're not sleeping. You're not managing your stress. You're not spending time. So it's just like, virtually every aspect of the American lifestyle and diet and environment is destructive to mental health. So it's like, I'm all for protocols. I can write protocols in my sleep, but we have to address this. And if those, you know, fundamental pieces aren't there, like you're wasting your time, your money, so on and so forth. Today's episode is brought to you by Organifi. Organifi is a line of organic superfood blends that offer plant-based nutrition made with high quality ingredients. Most of us could use a little more energy in our day, but caffeine can only do so much. At some point, we have to look at root causes of our fatigue. Organifi creates delicious superfood blends that address both of these problems. They use adaptogenic herbs and mushrooms to help balance cortisol levels associated with stress, and they make it easier to add more nutrients into your day. 
You can experience Organifi's high quality superfoods without breaking the bank. Go to www.organifi.com backslash Heather20 and use code Heather20 for 20% off your order. Absolutely. I'm so glad you went there because I am a firm believer, you know, that we can't have the the physiological and the psychological without the spiritual component. Yeah. They are all connected. They are all embedded. And I want to bring up a point, you know, earlier when we were talking about Brian Walsh, and I was thinking back to that time. And I remember sitting there with him and him disclosing that I want to say it was maybe 2014. At that point, he had 20 something colleagues that had been suicidal, right? These these naturopathic doctors all of a sudden whom are out there preaching all of these health and wellness uh, modalities and really trying to raise awareness around the damaging impacts of pharma, pharmacological medications and the conventional model and all these things. And I'm thinking, oh, sure. Okay, sure. Yeah, you know, I'm sure there's some connection, but I really didn't think a whole lot about it until we fast forward to 2020 and all of a sudden we start seeing what's happening with this pandemic and with all of the censorship that has been occurring around really being able to address the true health and wellness uh, markers that are contributing to the you know the mortality rates of this virus and i remember just recently sitting there thinking to myself Bottom line is, is that this is all spiritually based. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of us, the reason that we suffer so badly and we find ourselves in professions where we're overworking ourselves 16 hours a week, 16 hours, you know, six days a week and chasing perfect body composition, all of these things, it's because the, the consciousness is so disconnected from the physical and we have to really make more of an effort at trying to um, integrate, integrate all of that, you know, back in. And so when you were saying earlier that you were having challenges around where you fit in this space because you didn't have the credentialing, you are my friend, what I call a healer a true healer, someone who innately has the wisdom, the knowledge and the information that they have been able to uh, cultivate from, you know, lifetimes of experiences that is literally stored in the DNA of our cells. But unfortunately, we've been indoctrinated into this um, institutionalized education system where we've been taught to trust credentials. And in my opinion right now, trusting credentials is a very, very scary place to be. This is not necessarily the approach that we should be taking when we're trying to decipher and discern information that's going to be in our best interest. So when you were talking, you reminded me of um, a, there is a book, it's called The Way of Integrity. Are you familiar with that book by um, Martha Beck? I'm not. Okay, I'm going to highly encourage you to read this book, okay? Because I think that for individuals, practitioners like yourself and myself who have this innate knowledge that is just so deeply embedded within us, but we can't trust it because of society conditioning in terms of having to have these credentials, right? Like you, I almost went the conventional route just so that I could have the credentials. And then I was having a conversation with John Berardi and I was like, look, John, here's the deal. I'm thinking I have to go back to school and I either need to get a degree in psychology or I need to get a degree in, you know, um, I was thinking about becoming a um, endocrinologist. Like I'm you know, trying to really get to the root of what it is I need the credentials for so that people will actually take me seriously. And he looked at me and he was like, Heather, why? He's like, why do you feel you need these credentials? And I said, well, so people will take me seriously. And he's like, well, is what you, you know, the work that you do, does it work? And I was like, yeah, you know, I have lots of success. 
He's like, then, then why, why do you feel it necessary? And that's when I had my big epiphany. Oh, this is totally conditioning from society where we're taught as practitioners. We can't trust our innate knowledge that is guiding us to the truth to truly have the ability to support others. So I encourage you to keep cultivating those gifts, my friend. I want you to read this book. I'll send you a link to the book so that you can actually um, find it. But I think what Martha is, is referring to in this is that we have to trust that innate inner wisdom that we, it's, it's embedded in the genetics of ourselves. We carry it from each experience. And um, this is also the same root of why so many people have illness, right? Absolutely. You were really speaking the same language. I always like to refer to it as the, the innate intuition of, of the human soul. And yes. I, you know, in a lot of ways, I think as time goes on with my career, pe people will see me kind of expand um, my teachings a little bit. Cause like right now I have my career really zoned in on, you know, lab testing and biomarkers and the hard science, because I do think like, I, I feel very summoned to map that out in a way to kind of create a roadmap for, you know, your, your typical self healer, somebody that's like, Hey, I've been chewed up and spit out by the conventional model. I'm getting this functional go around in the functional medicine space and just bleeding money and not getting better. Um, so I really want to empower people to know how to do their own work and guide that process using reliable objective data and sort of this kind of mapped out methodology. So that's kind of what I'm doing right now, but that's like the what, that's not the why, right? And the why is so much more deeply tied to the spiritual and that innate intuition. Um, I'm a hard headed, driven, ambitious young man. So like, I do not care about academia and credentials, people hide behind letters and get very egocentric and arrogant. And, you know, I've dealt with plenty of those archetypes and I just don't care. Um, yeah, I really Logic. don't. Yeah. And, and this is where I think the collective is extremely disconnected from our innate intuition. And I think in 2020 and 2021, throughout this pandemic, there is a huge polarization occurring where there's the people that are a little bit more intuitively connected and they see the writing on the wall. Their, their soul is screaming that like, this does not feel right. Like there is something horribly wrong about what's going on in this nation and how our government is censoring and propagandizing. And, you know, it's your, your intuition should be screaming right now. And if it's not you're probably really disconnected, right, right, from that gut instinct sort of thing. And so this is where I'll kind of throw a little bit of a curveball into the conversation where this is why I'm a huge fan and advocate uh, of psychedelics, where um, I think long term, I'm going to do a lot more with psychedelics. It's kind of just now exploding. And it's still really, uh, it's, it's amazing to me how it really hasn't caught on as much as I thought it had, because the science is there. It's very strong. It's very promising. And what I like about that field is there's the two sides of it. There's more just the uh, hard science, the, the, what is the potential efficacy of these things as a therapeutic period? Like take away the spiritual and the woo woo and the, the trippy, the, you know, take away that and just look at it from a mechanistic efficacy, therapeutic perspective. And these compounds, psilocybin and LSD and MDMA and ayahuasca and DMT and whatever, they have so much promise because of their profound ability to reduce neuroinflammation and boost neuroplasticity, which is the simplified way of saying like, you want to decrease mental illness and neurodegeneration and promote neural repair. That's how you do it. You, you turn off the neuroinflammation, you boost the neurogenesis, neuroplasticity, and that's really mechanistically how these compounds work. So from a therapeutic perspective, it's very promising 
But then there's that spiritual esoteric component where, you know, people that experience these things say it's the most moving and powerful and profound, like life altering experience of their life. Because the way I describe it is psychedelics, they help you tap into your intuitive vision that I think so many people are disconnected from. And people are so lost within themselves and in the matrix. And it kind of turns the lights back on, right? Absolutely. And I think a lot of that has to do with the programming and the conditioning of the expectation from society, the collective, the agendas at hand, right? They tell us this set dynamic of how our life is supposed to unfold. And most of us, that is not innately our pathway. That is not the way that we're supposed to go. And so it creates a lot of discomfort and confusion within. And then we seek modalities to comfort and soothe our disrupted soul. And most of it comes in the form of unhealthy, sabotaging, you know, behaviors. Myself, I am a firm believer in psychedelics. However, um, I think there's a lot of irresponsibility that's, that's uh, going on right now because psychedelics have become more trendy and more buzzworthy. And people are, again, so attached to that quick fix. And they think I'm going to go and do an ashwagandha. I'm going to go and do, you know, uh, a mushroom trip and I'm going to be healed. And unfortunately it doesn't work that way. Um, I think that you really have to be committed to doing the healing work in order to get the most out of the experience. Um, I, you know, when I was in my later teens, I missed like 54 days of my senior year because I dropped acid in homeroom and then was tripping hardcore and would end up leaving. I I've had my fair share of, of lots and lots of psychedelics, but mushrooms and ashwagandha over the last few years have been significant tools in my journey. Um, I did a lot of inner child work, a lot of inner child healing work. And so in February of 2020, I got invited to a ceremony and it was something that I had been, you know, kind of entertaining the idea. Did I really want to do this? And so I said to myself, here's the intention I'm setting behind this experience. If I truly have done the inner child work and I have helped to heal those inner children, then I want my inner children to introduce me to my future self. So when I went into my ashwagandha experience, that was the intention I set. And in the end, that's exactly what I received. I had the most beautiful affirming experience that all of the work I had done over the last 12 years specifically had served its purpose. And um, for me, that was amazing. However, that same you know, journey there was another individual who was there looking for just a quick fix. And unfortunately that individual went into a state of psychosis and never came out of that psychosis. And there's a lot of practitioners out that, out there, especially in the uh, spiritual entrepreneurial field that are really taking advantage of consumers and, you know, uh, individuals who are hurting and who are desperate for a fix. And so I highly encourage listeners if, psychedelics are something that you have been contemplating that you feel you have been spiritually called to do your research don't just jump on board with the person who says they got some shrooms and they can help you out because i don't recommend it i think you do need to um set yourself up for success for me with the ashwagandha there's a very specific diet that you have to he you know follow for a significant amount of time to ensure that there's the least amount of toxicity in your body, at least amount of proteins that are going to interact with the medicine itself. So there it's more than just, you know, popping something into your mouth and experiencing this monumental experience. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's good to have a disclaimer. And, and this is, this is why it's definitely not the focal point of, you know, my, my work and my content, my platform, because the reality is, 
you know, there's a lot of uh, scientific and legal hoops that need to be, you know, uh, accomplished before well, it's going to be legal, regulated, available. And even then, there's a huge difference between, you know, if they were using like a, you know, concentrated psilocybin as a pharmaceutical prescription right. at like a, you know, microdose that's helping contribute to serotonergic activity versus, you know, yeah, like you, you bought some sketchy thing off some sketchy person and pop right. a bunch. So yeah, it's, it's one of those, but, but uh, from a therapeutic perspective, so, you know, this is, oh, go ahead. Well, I just want to interrupt and my apologies. I want to make this point because we're talking about it from a psychological perspective, but there's also a physical component. My husband had uh, planters warts that were so deeply embedded into the bottom of his foot. I'm talking holes this big, this deep that were just missing from these planters warts that he had been battling for a little over five years. So he decided that he was gonna microdose and attempt to heal the planters warts with the cybacillum from the microdosing. And within less than six weeks of microdosing, those planters warts were completely healed. There is literally no evidence of him ever having any kind of planters warts. So I always joke, I'm like, ah, it took a fungus to heal a fungus. That's pretty interesting, right? Oh, yeah. It's the truth. There's a lot of physical components that these medicines also have to offer beyond just the psychological and the, the conscious benefits. There's also a lot of true physical healing that can happen as well. Absolutely. I, it's, I think there's a lot more to break down, you know, the stigma and taboo around psychedelics and changing the perspective. Like it's, it's, it's going to follow, it's going to take another like 10, 20 years. That's a $50 billion industry that's getting ready to erupt safe investment, in my opinion, yeah, but it's sure. going to follow the same pipeline as cannabis did where everybody, you know, stigmatized cannabis and thought like you're a loser pothead and whatever. Right. Whereas now it's like, okay, we've researched it. We've built an infrastructure structure and industry around it. So, you know, it's going to take 10, 20 years, but um, there's so, a lot of promise there. So I'm curious, Brendan, tell me, where did your spiritual journey come into this whole physical and psychological journey for you? For me, I can tell you the spiritual was the very last piece that I embraced. And it wasn't until 2018 where I forced myself into isolation up in Mount Shasta, where I really had my true embracement of that spiritual component to this human existence in which we are experiencing. Yeah. Whew, I mean, that's a big question. Um, I was not brought up in, in an organized religious setting. And, and here's the thing, the institu institutionalization, you know, of our world with big pharma, big tech, government, uh, insurance, Education. academia, you know, all these just giant systems that I think they started out okay, but capitalism is kind of a double-edged sword. And, you know, when a system gets that big, that powerful, and there's, there's too much money. And so, I mean, you just, you see it everywhere you look in American culture where it's like you turn on the TV and you're getting like fast food, commercial, pharmaceutical, sugar, pharmaceutical, and it's just nonstop. And it just, it doesn't make any sense. The, the, the system's gotten too big, too hungry, too, too, uh, you know, money hungry. Right. And so I just, all these man-made systems, um, they're so imperfect. And I think it bastardizes the human experience in a lot of ways. Now, obviously we need some regulation, some government, some order to the chaos that is just, you know, being a sentient being on human earth. Right. Um, but the spiritual side of it, you know, I, I think spirituality is everybody should define what that means for them. Everybody should kind of create their own spiritual practice and, um, like I don't have anything against organized religion per se, but I think it's dysfunctional, <laughs> right? So this is where I kind of, I talk about functional spirituality and what does that mean for you? Um, and you know, ultimately I think there's a lot to be said for, you know, psyche means spirit, right? So when we're talking about your psyche and your psyche, psychology like we're we are talking about your spirit we are talking about that essence of the human form that 
Um, it's a beautiful experience. So for me, I don't know, it was really kind of in my mid twenties, I started really kind of, as I am becoming an independent man, like what are my spiritual beliefs and what are my beliefs around? Like, why are we here? And why am I here? And what, what's my role? What's my purpose? Like, what do I want out of life? So, um, I think there's a lot that every human has to answer those questions for themselves and decide to define what their core values are and, and what kind of legacy they want to, you know, leave behind. But what's cool is like, I, I find a lot of spiritual connection in the natural world. And I think that's a huge part of it is we're so disconnected from our natural environment, that that really kills our sense of connection to the rest of, you know, the universal consciousness. And that, you know, it can get a little bit woo or whatever. But even if you look at like microbiology, you know, bacteria don't operate in these independent, like, well, I'm a bacteria and I'm going to go live my self-indulgent egocentric bacteria life and go do my own thing. Right. No, bacteria work together. They're using quorum sensing to communicate and, you know, they work as a colony. It's, it's about the, the welfare of the collective, not the individual bacterium. And the thing is humans, we're no different. We have more bacterial cells in us and on us than human cells. So it's like, I think humans, we have gotten way too egocentric and self-indulgent and we're chasing our own kind of self-indulgent dreams or whatever. Like we're meant to be contributing to the welfare, welfare of the collective. We are intrinsically wired to operate that way and to go against that. Like we are the dysbiotic organism of the planet. Like we're kind of the infection of the planet. And that's not a cynical thing. It's just like, I don't think we're going to, collectively awaken until we reachieve symbiosis with one another and the natural world around us. Whereas right now, like you look at society, it's so polarized and ugly and hateful. And all the while we're destroying the planet very quickly, right? So we have to reachieve symbiosis, then we'll find a little bit more harmony. Absolutely. You know, to your point, there's a fantastic um, documentary that people can watch on Netflix called Fantastic Fungi. Have you watched that? Oh, it's a beautiful film. It is. It's. It really speaks to exactly what you were just um, painting the picture of, right? Because it's really that collective and the purpose and how we can't live with one, you know, we can't have life without. We, we're all connected. It's yeah. all connected and we are symbiotic. And I think that, you know, as we mentioned earlier, that's one of the things that unfortunately conventional medicine has taken out of the perspective is this idea of how everything is interconnected and works together. It's the physical, it's the mental and the spiritual. We can't have one without the other. I love the fact that um, you truly have the ability to embrace all of those component components and really look at the big picture of mind, body, spirit, soul, and how can we take personal responsibility for our own actions. I love that you want to empower individuals to be their own health experts. That is my mission as well, so that we aren't dependent on these systems. We have the ability to tune, listen to what our bodies are telling us, and then know exactly what kind of action steps we need to take to get back into that position of alignment. You know, when you were talking about being one with nature, from a physiological perspective, the moment we threw shoes onto our the soles of our feet, the soles of our feet, you know, we could talk days, I'd be like, why do we call them the soles of our feet if they are to be grounded with the earth so that there is a exchange of ions that is to take place that energetically allows our body to stay within a specific flow that connects us with that higher consciousness and that all knowing information. Um, I don't know, seems intentional to me, but bottom line is get your fucking shoes off, get your asses outside, walk around, get your feet dirty and allow some amazing things to happen. So Brendan, what piece of advice do you give the listeners who, um, you know, have been with us today on this little journey, talking all of the things they're feeling very confused. However, something that we've discussed feels right and they want to get started. What piece of advice do you have for them? 
You know, the, the first step, in my opinion, it, there, there's a time, like, I think people should work with a practitioner that knows what the hell they're doing and, and actually investigate some of these things. However, as we mapped out, like, I think the very first step, people need to go stare at themselves in the mirror, look deep into your own eyes, and really get brutally brutally honest with yourself because there are so many things that like we know it amazes me like even with my own clientele it amazes me how many of them they like they don't want to do coaching they don't want to work on their diet and their lifestyle because like they know and it's like well knowing isn't enough you actually have to do it right um but that's where it's like you know the the day-to-day -day behaviors of eat this not that or you know work out this way and move your body and sleep that's all secondary to figuring out like why what what are your core values what what is your why like get down to wh like what are you trying to do what are you trying to express through your life right so i just i think too many people again spiritually bypassing but if they face themselves in the mirror, like stop running from that stuff, you know, you need to do, whether it's that, you know, trauma you haven't resolved or those self-limiting beliefs that you're just kind of enabling and bypassing and choosing the self-destructive behaviors or the self-indulgent or instant gratification, call yourself out on it. You, you got to own your shit. And that's the hardest step. And it's amazing what lengths people will go to, to avoid doing that. But it's like, you're just going to be, you know, running on that hamster wheel for the rest of your life and relying on external figures. You know, you, it's it's a journey of the self. It's a journey inwards, and that's that's the start. That's the finish. That's where it's all at. Uh, speaking my language, my friend, you could not have given more on point advice. I know for myself and my journey, like I mentioned, I had to take personal responsibility to recognize how I was the common denominator. Yeah. That I had to drop out that victim mentality that we are so taught, it is so programmed, so conditioned in us to be the victim, but taking that a personal accountability and recognizing that you are the one running around shooting yourself in the foot day after day after day. And unfortunately, it is a challenge to have to look in the mirror and assume that responsibility, but it is truly the only way to get through. And when we make that choice, what we'll find is not only will our spiritual component, but our physical and our mental will also get into alignment and start behaving in the way that we truly desire. So Man, my friend, what a gifted healer you are. The, you know, I, I am so grateful for the work that you are doing and for you, you honoring and, and um, standing up to all of the controversy and all of the things out there that conflict with um, what we've been taught when it comes to pursuing our health and wellness journey. I totally applaud you for holding your own, standing on your own two feet and truly fighting for what is right when it comes to the collective and to the human experience. So thank you. Oh, thank you. I, I think we have some kindred spirit syndrome going on here. And, and like we said, kind of offline, uh, I live for these types of conversations, right? I, I think human connection, uh, I think kindness is medicinal. And I think that's so much like the antidote uh, that our world and, and population really needs right now. So I think these types of conversations, these types of meaningful energetic exchanges, uh, I think that's really where the magic is. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity to connect with you and kind of get into these nuanced conversations that are watered down and all these talking heads on the internet. And I'm so tired of all of that. So very grateful to you. You know, now I have one more question to ask you if you're sure. up for it. Oh, absolutely. So I feel like right now the masculine has, you know, significantly been under attack for quite some time. And the intuitive feel I get from you is that you are an extremely well-balanced masculine. So um, what, how, how have you navigated through being able to embrace that masculinity despite the absolute attack that it has recently been under? How do you embrace that? And how do you help other men also cultivate and embrace that that masculine that divine masculine 
Well, thank you. It, it means a lot. And honestly, I, I don't really get asked very often, but that's where the whole like holistic savage moniker came from, right? Uh, just like with my my bio and my backgrounds on, you know, I was pursuing the Navy SEAL, um, you know, career and, and pipeline because like as a kid, I fell in love with martial arts. That was my first real love and the, the whole way of the samurai and Bushido and, you know, samurai means to serve and their code of honor and ethics that was Bushido. Um, they lived and died by those core values. It was, you know, they were these altruistic, you know, warriors for the highest good and for light and love and kind of those, you know, savage warriors that they'll put their life down and they would rather, you know, die in shame by their own hand than, or, you know, die with honor than, than to live, you know, in shame. And like, where are some of those core values anymore in society? I, I think America is the greatest country on earth. We haven't had our best couple of years, but I still do believe America is the greatest country on earth and the, the ideals that this country was built, like we need to get back to that. And, you know, there's that cycle, they say, uh, you know, hard times create hard men's and, you know, soft times create soft men and kind of all that peaceful times, whatever. And I think we're running into that a lot. And, um, Unfortunately, I think there's still kind of this, you know, to be a strong man, there's like, oh, you, you're to be strong is like, to not be in touch with your emotions or to repress your emotions or not show emotion. And that's so backwards, like, no, if you really want to be a strong man, like you have to be very in tune with your energetic state. And that's what differentiates like martial arts, right? Martial arts is all about controlling your chi and your energy. And, you know, you, you can't have an ego like martial arts is, is domesticating the ego and, and the higher self is really kind of, you know, gripping the wheel. So um, I don't know. I, I try to do the best I can because I, I did that. I did the tough guy thing for years and years. It was a very self-destructive way of living and just kind of that. That's what I call the toxic masculinity, right? Totally. Totally. I'm just such a badass. And like, yeah. I, I don't feel any. And it's a very like self-loathing and you just pour this hatred and it's this like, just be hard, hard, hard. Um, but that, you know, yin and yang, right? Like you, the, the masculine, the feminine, the light, the shadow you can't be a whole person without embracing and mastering both sides of it so right. that's that inner work and you know same thing unfortunately there's a lot of men that you know are spiritually bypassing that work and they're kind of emotionally stunted right and they need to kind of get in touch with that and can control it well you're doing it beautifully my friend you are an incredible role model for so many out there um i i truly applaud you you i i feel i feel you and you are so well balanced i'm i'm extremely impressed and i'm i'm actually feeling called if you're open to it um i think we should collaborate on on some additional things um i definitely am feeling some some kindred spirits you reuniting here. And uh, I think our paths were meant to cross so that we can help support and serve um, humanity because we are in some desperate times, my friend. Oh, desperate. Absolutely. Yeah, desperate. no, it, it would be an honor to be down anytime. And uh, we do, I mean, there's a lot of us, you know, kind of light workers, if you will, that like, yeah, we need to be banding together to, to yeah. really kind of evoke this movement that needs to happen, so. Absolutely. Well, Brendan, thank you so much for your time, your knowledge, your expertise. How can the audience find you and connect with you? Sure, thank you. Uh, the The main platform is Instagram. That's where I just pour out, you know, my heart and soul and everything in between. Um, mm -hmm. So that's the Holistic Savage is the the username. Uh, and then, you know, the business name is Metabolic Solutions. So if people want to, you know, train with me or whatever, that's that's the business. But uh, Holistic Savage is kind of that main platform that I just put everything out there. Well, I will make sure to have both of these linked in the show notes so that it makes them easy to find you. And again, thank you so much for being with us today. I truly appreciate it. Likewise, Heather. This was a lot of fun. I'll look forward to staying connected and collaborating. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us on the Think Yourself Healthy podcast. Make sure you leave a review and let me know what you think. I love reading your feedback. 
Come hang out with me on Instagram at Heather Duranja. And don't forget to take a screenshot that you're listening to the podcast and tag me. I love to share it. See you on the next episode.